So the hour of uh, nine o'clock having arrived, let me um, call this public meeting of the Oregon Board of Forestry to order. I wanna welcome everybody to this. Obviously, um, we're in very unusual times. Uh, and with that comes new processes for us to navigate through. So just a few tips um, to help us move through today's meeting. Um, and I wanna welcome everybody who is able to participate, whether you're uh, a public member um, listening in. And uh, by the way, we wanna make sure that you know that the presentations will be um, on the website, so you should be able to follow those along. Where we have those, um, to ensure that board members, presenters, and the public listening in can hear these proceedings, I want to ask everybody, as we usually do, to silence their cell phones and limit background noises for the duration of the meeting. Um, I also want to say to members of the public that if you would like to submit written testimony for this meeting and have it included in the record for this meeting, please send those in uh, by May 6th. That will uh, help in the preparation of our board's meeting minutes. Obviously, we're happy to hear from you anytime, but if you want your comments to be part of this meeting, uh, having them by May 6th uh, would be most helpful. Uh, board members and presenters, I want to thank you all for preparing for this meeting in advance. Also want to suggest that when you are not speaking that you mute yourself on your device. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I know just from other meetings I've either been in or, or witnessed, um, that's something people forget to do all the time. They forget two things. One is to uh, unmute themselves when they're speaking and the other is to mute themselves again when they're not. So. We'll, we'll all work on that. Uh, for board members, I want to recommend that we take a roundtable approach for the voting process and Q&A so that um, we'll, uh, if, you'll use, if you have questions, please use the raise hand feature in Zoom. I assume now everybody has been able to identify that. And that means for presenters that we'll do our best to ask questions uh, one at a time. So um, we'll test this out now. Uh, so if you'd unmute yourselves so we can do a, a roll call. Um, Mills Christofferson. Here. Cindy Deacon Williams. Here. Joe Justice. Here. Jim Kelly. I see you, Jim, and I see you moving. I don't hear you. I'm here. Great, thank you. Brenda McComb. Here. Mike Rose. Here. And I'm Tom Imison. I'm here. Um, so thank you, everybody. And now we'll move uh, under the consent agenda. Um, items C and D are information items, so need no approval. But um, ask, I'd like to ask a, a motion for approval of the consent items A and B. So moved. Second. And moved and seconded. Um, any discussion? Then all those in favor, uh, let's just go through the list so that we know we have you. So we'll be doing this with roll call, but Nils? Aye. Cindy? Aye. Joe? Aye. Jim? Aye. Brenda? Aye. Mike? Aye. And, and I'm aye as well, so that motion passes. Um, and we'll uh, also need to approve the minutes. Or are uh, those part of the consent item in this case, uh, Hillary? Or have we, do we need a separate motion? That is correct. They are item A. Okay, yeah, th those were items A and B. Okay, they're both approved. Um, and we have C and D, so we'll now move to the state foresters' um, comments. Good morning, folks. Uh, it's only been eight weeks since our last meeting, but it seems a lot longer with all the changes due to the coronavirus pandemic and our response to it. However, I'll start on a positive note. Today is National Administrative Professionals Day. This day provides a welcome moment 
uh, to recognize the professionalism and positive contribution our skilled administrative staff brings to our daily workings here at the Department of Forestry. I am fortunate to receive exceptional support from Brandy Ritter, who has continued to maintain the high level performance of our executive support team. Uh, thanks to the team members, Megan Enley, Kristen Bader, Crystal Bader, Leanna Dickerson. It's difficult enough to support the exec team, but now it's especially like herding cats with most of us telecommuting most of the time. Uh, and a special thanks to Hillary Olivus Rood, who provides great board support. Uh, and finally, to all ODF administrative staff here in Salem and throughout the districts. We could not do our job without these professionals. So. April is also the time when we prompt the board about their self-evaluation regarding best practices and governance. That was agenda item B. Uh, this evaluation informs one of our agency's key performance measures. And Sabrina Perez, administration senior strategy manager, will follow up next week with the survey and an overview of the process. As I described in my emails, we are focusing on protecting the health and safety of our employees while maintaining core business and supporting the state's response to the COVID-19 outbreak. We are providing 15 to 20 incident management teams or IMT members to support the Office of Emergency Management Operations. We are on our third team deployment and when that is completed, we will get a break to prepare for fire season. ODF's teams have been an integral part of the state response to COVID-19 and they've been doing an incredible job at the Emergency Coordination Center. They showed up at the EEC, or sorry, ECC, to help support response efforts, even though it meant leaving their family during a pandemic and increasing their risk of exposure. I greatly admire their dedication to public service. I cannot recall any time since I've been at ODF where all three of our incident management teams have so served a full two week assignment before fire season even starts. In addition, ODF's Doug Graff and Travis Medema and Oregon State Fire Marshal's Mariana Ruiz Temple um, with assistance from subject matter experts from both agencies have been working closely with the governor's office on standing up a multi-agency coordination group or MAC group. This group provides direction and leaders intent to the ECC, which then coordinates statewide res uh, response operations based on the MAC's group input. We're planning to get them back in May so they can turn their focus to the upcoming fire season. The COVID-19 crisis also creates a unique challenge for our recreation, education, and interpretation program employees. At a time Oregonians need to stay home to save lives, they are also craving to get outdoors and reconnect with nature. While we have closed our Tillamook Forest Center and campgrounds, our forests remain open for diverse recre dispersed recreation. Our REI staff is monitoring usage to address areas where we see challenges to maintaining social distance. The team's leadership and expertise are developing solutions to issues as they arise and those that we'll face when we get back to full operations. Any questions on that? Great. As we described in our April report to the Joint Ways and Means Committee, we paid off the $25 million state treasury line of credit in March. Our cash reserves declined, but our model projected modest growths over the next couple months. However, we have adjusted these projections due to the economic impacts from the virus response. The, economic, the impact is occurring in the timber market with mills implementing temporary shutdowns and with a decline in log prices. We project that state forest revenues will decline along with timber price decreases. We also project declines in harvest tax revenue 
that partially fund private forest administration of the Forest Practice Act. We are also seeing increased expenditures as we support the state's response to COVID-19, as well as in the additional preparation needed for fire season due to the virus. Our model shows that faster than projected collections of accounts receivable are offsetting this impact due to COVID-19, resulting in a better than expected uh, budget position. In consultation with the Chief Financial and Legislative Fiscal Offices, we have submitted a notice of intent for a general fund appropriation and other fund limitation request for a potential May emergency board meeting. There's only about 51 million currently in the emergency fund, and we ask for more than that amount to highlight the reality of our financial situation. It will be up to the legislators to determine where the lines of policy and risk lie in relation to our funding. Monday evening, we re received notice of an e-board meeting this Thursday, and the fire season cost is on that agenda. So we uh, should have an answer of some sort uh, after Thursday, and I will follow up by email with you all on that. Um, our CFO and LFO analysts have been instrumental in sharing our story and needs across their sphere of influence and have truly been in, uh, partners in this, uh, in our financial efforts. Uh, we, re we structured our request the same as our February request. We're asking for 48.4 million in general fund, which is down uh, due to the better collections of which 27.7 allow us to maintain core business at our current service level, uh, 700,000 to pay for the fire finance consulting contract with MGO, and 20 million for a mild or low cost fire season. Our second request asks for 92 million in additional general fund to ensure we can conduct firefighting activities in the event of a high cost 2020 fire season. And then finally, we had an additional request. We asked for 1 million of the special 2 million spa with, for shoulder work of seasonal employees. And we did this to cover the extra costs for personal protective equipment, training, and supporting extended attack and IMT efforts required by working in a COVID 19 environment. In addition to the timber market impacts, <clears throat> the COVID-19 crisis and the social distancing measures taken have significantly affected the overall economy and expected state revenue. The state's chief office, operating officer and chief financial officer have directed agencies to slow non-critical spending including holding non-critical positions vacant. They expect agencies to just delay final spending decisions on non-critical items as the state continues to face this public health crisis. Everyone is waiting for the next revenue forecast, which is May 20th, and more details and guidance on Oregon's share of the Federal CARES Act. Our expectation is that there will be a significant decline in the forecast, and there's uncertainty on how the federal stimulus will offset that decline. We are expecting that all state agencies will need to make mid-biennium adjustments to our current budgets. In developing our strategic response and adjusting our programs to respond to anticipated funding gaps, our primary concern are our employees, our most important asset. We need to maintain core business functions while minimizing potential impacts to current employees. The principles are the same for all of our divisions, but there will be differences in strategies and tactics because the financial drivers and the potential impacts are different by division. I have identified mission crit cr critical principles for our work going forward. Our employees come first and we're trying to minimize the risk for potential layoffs. 
we continue to protect the health and safety of our employees, their families, and the public, maintain emergency response capability, fire preparedness and suppression, and maintain core business functions required to protect, manage, and promote stewardship of Oregon's forest. I have directed human resources to post all permanent position recruitments for a minimum of 30 days. This allows more time for applicants to assess each position in the light of COVID-19 and a potential revenue decline, while at the same time creating some additional cost savings. In terms of slowing non-critical spending, we have been doing cost containment since July 19 to help manage the department's cash flow. We have been deferring non-essential services and supply purchases, postponing trainings, and significantly limiting all business-related travel. We will likely continue these cost containment measures throughout the rest of the biennium, but at a minimum, they'll remain in, the play, in place until we have a clearer picture of the funding impacts from COVID-19. I have asked all division chiefs to work with area directors to develop a strategic plan for financial management to address the projected budget gap, including vacancy management, other cost savings, and opportunities for new funds. The goal is to maintain options and minimize the risk of future layoffs. In order to maintain as many options as possible, we will be implementing some of the vacancy management and other cost saving measures as soon as possible. Uh, and these plans will be co coordinated amongst um, divisions and programs. And again, I'll pause for a moment if there's any questions. Great, moving on to fun. Uh, Cindy had her hand up. Cindy? Yes, hello. Um, I was wondering, uh, uh, I assume we are going to be reimbursed for the cost of the two weeks, three incident command teams that are doing work with the COVID-19. Do you have any feel for the time frame of that and how it might affect our cash flow through the summer? Uh, we are, I don't know the time frame. Um, the, what we're, uh, additional costs is really the overtime associated with those positions. Um, the emergency coordination center picked up, uh, well, that in per diem, but the uh, hotel rooms that we would normally pay for directly were picked up by uh, the emergency uh, coordination center. So the main cost were overtime and per diem, and we do expect reimbursement, but I don't have a good time frame. And we are monitoring um, those costs. I assume that they're uh, going to be picking up the, the direct uh, salary cost as well, since the work was, you know, sort of billed out essentially that they were loaned. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I expect them to pick up all the cost of those people. The difference is the only ones that really have an impact on the cash flow are the additional cost, because those people were employed anyway. Great. Thanks. Um, moving on to fire season outlook and preparedness. Well, I'm proud of the work our folks are doing for their fellow Oregonians and know their constant contributions are appreciated throughout state government. Fire season is fast approaching and we have been shifting our focus and resources from COVID-19 response to wildfire preparedness. The department is actively planning how to protect firefighters, their family, and the public from both fire and COVID-19 this fire season. We also need to plan for adequate resources to fight fire, expecting that we will have very limited access to nat national resources and those from other states. We're also planning for possible reductions in our own firefighting resources due to illness. In terms of the fire season outlook, snowpack is near to above normal in the Northern Cascades and extreme Eastern Oregon. 
the southwest and south central part of the state are below normal. That's 75 to 80 percent and normal. And snowpack under current conditions is melting faster than normal. For the remainder of the season, I expect a quicker melt out than normal. Drought is problematic most of the, with most of the state dry or in moderate drought. The southwest and north central Oregon are in severe drought and drought presents the highest correlation to effect on fire season. Long-term forecasts through July trends towards drier and warmer than average. All that said, unless we get very little lightning or wet lightning as we head into the summer and throughout the summer, we're looking more and more likely to have an above normal fire season, especially in the southwest, south central part of the state and along the east side of the Cascades. Our southwest district has already had 20 fires since April and is considering going into fire season as early as May 1st. Northwest and northeast Oregon look better and are less likely to have an above normal fire season. While some small scale wildfires may start before July, the beginning of the no above normal fire starts in acreage burn is most likely to begin in July. As we prepare for the 2020 fire season, the safety of our employees and public remain the top priority. We are developing and implementing measures to mitigate health and safety risks to employees, their families, and the public due to COVID-19. We are basing our actions on COVID-19 guidance from the CDC, OHA, and Oregon OSHA, and best practices and lessons learned from our fire and EMS service partners. ODF and the Forest Protective Association industry partners, landowners, and contract firefighting resources are collaborating with state and federal agencies to develop a framework for districts to use in building plans that will address their local needs. We will manage these plans at the area level and the protection division and ODF overall will provide the support needed for these efforts to be successful. Fire season preparedness, initial attack response, and extended attack large fire response each have unique risk mitigation needs to address. For starters, our fire manager is working closely with district areas and state leaders to evaluate local fire conditions and consider implementing fire restrictions in area closures earlier than normal to reduce the potential for human caused fires this spring. We're also working on getting more fire prevention information out into the public to, in an attempt to reduce the number of human caused fires on the landscape this fire season. To help ensure our folks stay healthy while preparing for fire season, we are changing the way we deliver firefighting training. Where it's possible to move to online and distance learning, we are relying on those modes. Where in classroom or hands-on training is required, we're either reducing the number of students to allow for physical distancing or postponing the trainings. The Interagency Wildland Fire School, which normally brings over 100 fire personnel together for a week in Sweet Home in June, has been canceled for this year. We are directing students to alternate sources for that education. We're also waiving the fitness test in wild land fire safety refresher training for those employees who were current as of last year. Uh, new employees will complete fitness tests with COVID-19 mitigation measures implemented. Uh, in terms of initial attack and extended attack, we're also identifying ways we can keep people healthy throughout the fire season, ensure we have resources we need to protect Oregonians and state resources from wildfires. We're evaluating the feasibility of a variety of COVID-19 risk mitigation efforts for when our employees are in transit, including 
uh, limiting vehicles to two occupants to allow for appropriate social distancing, assigning employees to a specific vehicle or engine for the entire season, um, and limiting others' access to those vehicles, uh, treating the crew as a module to limit the number of people with which an individual has to interact, wearing masks while in transit, and establishing and enforcing disinfecting protocols for vehicles. We're also working with the Department of Corrections on safe and efficient firefighter training to prepare our adults in custody to, to provide uh, fire season support as they do in most fire seasons. Finally, we are developing strategies to mitigate the potential for COVID-19 infection at the fire camps that support large fire incidents. Some of the options we are considering include in reducing the number of people at a single camp and providing packaged food instead of using cater-provided cater kitchens. Um, this work is a uh, a living process and as we learn more information we keep updating our strategies and with that are there any questions any questions for Peter at all on this any comments from board members Okay, uh, not seeing any. Thank you, Peter. Do we have the folks uh, uh, who are going to participate in the next agenda item? Are they all now um, available, or, or do we need to wait uh, a couple minutes for that? For the record, I'm Terry Free, monitoring coordinator with ODF Private Forest. Good morning and happy Earth Day. I'm glad to be here with you virtually. I want to thank uh, Ariel Cowan and Kyle Abraham. For helping to pull this together, the researchers and bring their information to you today, and Hillary for pulling this whole virtual meeting together. For today's top story, in January, the board requested contextual information on climate change. As it pertains to the FPA Streamside Protections Review along small and medium fish streams in the Siskiyou for meeting water quality and desired future condition goals. Today's valuable presentations focus on contextual information for the board to consider as we move towards July's sufficiency decisions. We also want this conversation and information to inform the board's broader discussions on new climate change policies and agency-wide policy goals. We worked with our stakeholders, including the recently formed advisory committee, to identify potential presenters that would provide this contextual information on climate change. We are grateful for this stakeholder input. We have three presenters for you today who also happen to receive the most stakeholder support. Their bios are in your board materials. Forest Service researcher Dr. Jessica Holofsky will not be able to do a full presentation today, but she will provide, did provide a written summary about predicted climate change impacts on forests in the Siskiyou and will participate in the panel discussion later. Kara Ann Laufdon, aquatic ecologist with ODF and W, Dr. Gordy Reeves, research fish ecologist, Meredith with Forest Service NW Research Station, will present summaries of climate change impacts on stream temperature and riparian forests. Gordy's, after Gordy's presentation, all three researchers will be available as a panel for the board's discussion and question and answer, and then I'll have a few closing remarks. We are very grateful for all three of these experts to take their time and share their information with the board today. Next slide, please. Note, I decided not to use beep from a school days because I reckon it would be too annoying. So I'm gonna present Dr. Jessica Holofsky's work and uh, later she can correct anything I might've inaccurately articulated. Next slide, please. The Southwest Oregon Adaptation Partnership is a forest service-led science management partnership to, to develop, to assess climate change vulnerabilities in Southwest Oregon. The assessment covered many aspects 
including hydrology, fisheries, including stream temperature, vegetation, wildlife, and ecosystem services. The general technical report is in press and it's available at www.adaptationpartners.org slash SWOAP. Next slide. Compared to observed historical temperature, average warming is projected to increase 4.3 to 10.1 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the 21st century. Increases in stream temperature in Southwest Oregon will be driven by increasing air temperature, lower summer stream flows from a loss of snowpack, and changes in vegetation cover over streams that is driven mostly by disturbance of fire and insects. Decreased summer stream flows and warmer water temperature will reduce the habitat quality for cold water fish species, especially at lower elevations. The primary effects of climate change on riparian areas in Southwest Oregon will likely be mediated through disturbance. Fire exclusion has resulted in denser forests in some riparian areas and adjacent uplands, which may facilitate more wildfires. Drying in riparian areas could decrease the extent of the riparian zone in some locations and or result in shifts in riparian plant community composition. I will now hand the discussion over to Kara Ann Lauf Dunn. Next slide, please. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today to you about stream temperature and climate change in the Siskiyou region. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. Next slide. So a conversation about temperature and climate change generally invokes this animation. This animation cycles through global temperatures from 1950 to 2013. And it is notable. Next slide. The reason it is notable uh, among many things is that we've had some predictability with variation, of course, uh, to temperatures and stream flows as well particularly in a seasonal sense. And with climate change, not only are we losing that predictability, but the seasonal effects are becoming more exaggerated. Next slide. Incorporating changes in the climate, the projections of future snowpack, stream flow, groundwater, and stream temperature are really the most relevant aspect of any natural resource research and monitoring program, specifically thinking about the timing and the amount of projected change. The projected changes in precipitation really represent a fundamental hydrologic regime shift. Uh, and along with that, we really uh, aren't really poised to understand how our species, both, both tree species and uh, fish and wildlife, are going to respond to these changes. Next slide. As aquatic ecologists, fisheries biologists, ODF and W, uh, and wildlife biologists, we're very interested in temperature. Uh, fish are ectotherms, meaning that their body temperature changes with that of their environment, which makes them extremely vulnerable to changes in temperature. There is an optimal range within which species can thrive and survive, uh, but changes in stream temperatures is going to alter and has already altered the distribution of phenology and survival of these species. And while adaptation of these species is certainly possible, uh, we just don't know enough about their thermal tolerances or their adaptive capacities to predict these things in a really precise way. Stream temperature is influenced by many things. So I wanna talk now about some of those bigger climate scale pieces for some background. Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> Stand by on that. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Uh, so stream temperature is influenced by numerous natural variables, including solar radiation, air temperature, ground temperature, precipitation, surface water inflows, and groundwater exchange. And there are many changes in our existing climate system that are already altering stream temperatures. Uh, today, I just am going to highlight a few of these. I'm going to talk about air temperatures, surface, and a little bit of groundwater. And then later on in the talk, I'll talk about some more local factors. Next slide. So I showed that animation of global air temperatures. Let's look a little bit more locally now. Next slide. So this is a graph that shows the historic trend of air temperatures in Medford. Uh, this area has, is, uh, has seen in the last few decades a pretty sizable increase in temperature. Next slide. But more regionally, we see you know, summer temperatures are 
poised to be five to 11 degrees warmer. Uh, and this is just for the summer, uh, but temperatures are year round are changing. Next slide. A similar graph showing warming in the winter in the Medford region, we see an increase of 2.1 degrees since 1970. Next slide. And more regionally, again, we see winter temperatures are going to be five to seven degrees warmer. And this is by 2070. This is a, um, you know, the, a pretty far out projection. Um, and an increase in winter temperatures, next slide, really translates to more, more rain and less snow. And less precipitation as snow and more as rain means that we're going to have an earlier snowmelt runoff. Um, now let's look at the regional precipitation patterns that are projected. Next slide. By 2070 in the winter, we're seeing mean and we, we are poised to see mean annual rainfall increases of zero to three inches. Next slide. And also by 2070, a greater than 50% decline in snow water equivalents in the mountains. Uh, which is the translation of, of water um, from snow. Next slide. And all of this means is that we're going to have reductions in stream flows and be shifting towards higher winter flows and lower summer and fall flows. Uh, stream flows have strong influence on stream temperature, even though they're often decoupled in, in monitoring and different things like that. Solar shading and conduction aren't the only way streams warm. As flow drops, you see an increase in thermal loading due to reduced volume of water. And so stream flow can really modulate the stream temperature, particularly in losing reaches where you have no groundwater recharge. Next slide. So projections of stream flow, this is by uh, 2070 in August, uh, we, we are seeing some locations will see a significant decrease in stream flow. And just to sort of explain this graph, the, the more orange, uh, the, the higher percent change from historical conditions. But I also want, folks to notice that there's quite a bit of variability in these decreases. So without this blanket decrease across this entire region, it really sets us up for opportunities to balance risk. Next slide. But a reasonable consequence of this set of temperature, precipitation, snowpack, and uh, associated evaporative deficit trends is drought. Next slide. This region has already been experiencing drought. This picture is taken uh, from Bear Creek in the Rogue Basin. This stream has been dry um, several times in the last few years, and it's a sizable system. Next slide. An analysis of drought potential in the western states has suggested that this region has a 40 to 50 percent chance of experiencing an 11-year drought, with a 20 to 50 percent chance of experiencing a 35-year mega drought. By the end of the century, we'll likely have experienced drought conditions like 2015, in for a 30 year period. Next slide. And just as these changes are impacting forests, we are already seeing these impact uh, fish and wildlife and, and likely things are going to worsen in the coming decades. And this really impacts our mission as ODFNW um, with climate and ocean change undermining the ability of lands and waters to support our fish and wildlife. Next slide. So because of this, I want to just briefly mention that ODFNW has been implementing and uh, working on implementing a policy on climate, uh, climate and ocean change. Next slide. And the, the goals of the policy are pretty straightforward. You know, the first two have real relevance to today's discussion. The first centers around using science to understand and act on the risks and opportunities associated with climate change. And the second recognizes that the impacts of climate change will be broad and they will be felt across all of Oregon in all sectors. And to be successful, we really need to coordinate our response among agencies. And one of the ways a coordinated response could be very useful and successful is through temperature. Next slide. So let's take a look at the temperatures now that we've looked at the climate influences um, on uh, projections for this region. So I'm going to show these first two slides. This, this slide shows June. So the, the left uh, map is June 2002 to 2011. So sort of thinking that is a baseline historic and then a 2080 projection on the right. And what you can see is uh, that, it, you know, things are cooler in June, but they, you start to see localized warming uh, and temperatures. And then of course that area just expands in 2080. Um, these data came from NorWest, which is a, a large crowdsourced data set uh, with a spatial stream networks model uh, run to extrapolate and predict temperatures for every re at the reach scale. 
Uh, and it's actually, it's really the best comprehensive data set we have for estimating and predicting temperatures across the entire state of Oregon and in the region as well. Um, and this region actually has quite a few sensors. And so uh, the, the estimates are, are, are good in this region. So next slide. So now I'm showing August. So you can see August, the baseline 2002-2011, looks pretty similar to the June 2080. Uh, and so really what we're seeing is this shift in earlier warming. Um, and then of course, when you look at August 2080, the extent and magnitude of temperatures um, just widen. Uh, and so some of this red can be mitigated. And I wanna talk now about, you know, this focus on local drivers of stream temperature. Next slide. So there are many local drivers of stream temperature, and we have a good feel for many of these, but they interact in really complex ways. Uh, so I'm just gonna talk about a few of them, um, and then Gordy, I think, is gonna really uh, emphasize uh, the, the riparian and shading piece. Um, but let's just talk about a, a couple of these. Next slide. So to start with geomorphology, stream temperature are influenced by underlying geology, so whether it's porous or it's impermeable nature, uh, valley shape, and general location within the watershed. When looking at local patterns, different stream morphology, hyperic exchange, uh, depths or bathymetry of pools and different uh, uh, habitat types, and channel curvature or sinuosity can really influence temperatures. If you add in, next slide, if you add in some wood, uh, you're really going to have create a therm thermally heterogeneous reach, but shading really matters. Next slide. Shading can significantly influence stream temperatures by helping to mitigate some of those extremely high 2080 projections that we saw. And I'm going to show a couple of slides that talk about some of this specifically, but I know Gordy is going to talk about this a little bit more detailed. Next slide. So this study came from Wanzel uh, recently in 2018, and it really shows this decrease in stream temperature given different scenarios. So you see these post-fire uh, in red, young open forest scenarios in lighter green, and then darker green is the mature forest scenarios. In their simulations, shading had a significant impact on stream temperatures, more so than air temperature and stream flow. And so really what this, uh, their, their study was mature forests are really decreasing stream temperatures. Next slide. And then next, with a focus a little more on the upland, in this study by Perry and Jones, you know, we saw forest, forest plantations produce summer stream flow deficits relative to mature and old growth forests. So really thinking that the management outside the riparian area really does influence stream flow and thereby stream temperature. And we are reflecting this in a new tool that I'm gonna discuss in, in a few minutes uh, uh, called Velma. This study had a lot of historical and contemporary data, and that is not always the case and is often the source of uncertainty. Next slide. And so one of the ways to reduce uncertainty, particularly in temperature, is to improve model estimates by improving monitoring. And we need that long-term data to make reliable and reasonable comparisons and understand the rate of change across our landscapes. Next slide. There are many tools and emerging technologies that can help us improve our ability to implement our policies, reduce uncertainty, and plan for the future. And I just want to mention one of these models to you today. Next slide. All right, if you wouldn't mind sort of clicking through all of this, I didn't know that it was an animation um, until the right the next one. Thank you. Thank you. So this is VELMA, which stands for Visualizing Ecosystems for Land Management Assessments Model. And VELMA has a number of inputs, as you can see, elevation, land cover, uh, soils, daily temperature, pervious surface. Um, we do not have, it, it, what, it has the ability to run these different scenarios based on land management. Uh, we don't have a good understanding for how forests and riparian areas are going to change under a changing climate. And we would love to work with the board and ODF to get a better understanding of this. And I, we feel that collaboration could really help both of us. Next slide. Again, this collaboration goes back to statewide coordinated response. And the steps are for, that, that we've sort of laid out is you know, coordinating inventories and vulnerability assessments, finding efficient research and monitoring uh, approaches, determining these clear priorities uh, within and across geographic areas, and then implementing those. Next slide. For temperature, coordinating monitoring can really help improve estimates of temperature across the state. And these models are only as good as the temperature or as the data that feeds them. 
And so the more information we have about temperature across the landscape, the better our estimates in individual reaches will be. So two of the approaches that we are proposing are for a sort of a statewide response, which will have less precision, but will still provide accurate year-round representations of stream temperature patterns every eight days. And then a selection of intensively monitored watersheds to help us understand the nuances related to spatial and temporal variability in stream temperatures. And so the, the map on the left shows locations where year-round monitoring is occurring uh, in a long-term sense. And while it looks like there's a lot of dots there, when you zero on individual watersheds, there really isn't enough. And then the map on the right is showing uh, locations, watersheds where we already have been, we have intensively monitored uh, temperature data. We'd like to increase the number of these watersheds throughout the state, and we've had conversations with uh, ODF about uh, contributing to this coordinated monitoring approach. Next slide. So having good temperature data will feed these assessments that are going to help us map these unique resources across our landscape and then be able to calculate protection or restoration value of reaches. And we, we want to do this in a spatially optimized way to reduce fragmentation so that we're not choosing reaches that, for example, fish can't access. And then, of course, ground truthing with local review. Next slide. And this really sets us up for clear geographic priorities, flow and temperature targets, and this geographic scaling of risk associated with land use. And having this better understanding of, of risk on the landscape is extremely beneficial. Next slide. The outcome is increased knowledge and help identifying these monitoring gaps. Next slide. So the approach we are taking follows this core concept of protecting the best and focusing restoration areas with the highest benefit, following sort of that flow on the side. Before I end today, I just want to give an example of how we would use temperature data in this in this sort of pathway. Next slide. So the steps in the process are simple. We map stream temperature, we develop biological criteria, and we classify reach suitability, ending up with a map of thermal suitability for native salmonids. Next slide. So first step of mapping stream temperatures, we use Norwest for this effort. Next slide. We develop biological criteria. So the way that we're going about doing this is understanding thermal tolerance of our cold, moderate cold, and warm water species. And we, what we do is we collect information about oxygen consumption across different temperatures, and we're looking to measure or calculate aerobic scope, which is the energy really required to just do anything, to digest a meal, to mate, to migrate, to evade a predator. So as you see on that graph, as that arrow of aerobic scope starts to narrow, as it gets warmer and warmer, the fish are in trouble. And so there is an optimal range at which aerobic scope can operate effectively for fish. Next slide. And so the goal is to take these mapped stream temperatures at the reach scale, uh, combine that with thermal tolerances of the, fish, of the species that are present and end up with a map showing thermal suitability across the landscape, which is, looks different than a map of just stream temperatures. Next slide. And so here is an example of these maps for this region. So the, the left hand is the baseline, so sort of conditions now and in the past, I guess, and then more suitable would be blue, less suitable would be orange and red, and then you can see the future projection of that. And this is considering, you know, no potential uh, adaptation uh, scenario for our fish. And next slide. And that's all I have to share for you today. I hope it was informative and I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, especially on Earth Day. Thanks. Any questions? I, I do have one uh, question, Akira. So you talked about uh, need for collaboration between ODF and ODFW and, and probably the boards as well. Where, do, where are we now on that um, effort? Is it Early stages, are we, uh, and what, I guess I'm curious about what steps um, you see that ought to be taken in the near term to enhance that collaboration. 
Yes, thank you for that question. I've had conversations with ODF, uh, I think I would but the consultants through the HCP process um, of engaging. And then I have a conversation in a couple of weeks with uh, another group uh, at ODF about this. I think that the, the first step is one, the agreeing that we need to do this and, and, and providing a coordinated response. The next step is, is things that I'm doing on my end is sort of understanding where we have data, where we have thermistors, where we need data, and then how we can kind of share that, share that load uh, and, uh, you know, in, in processing the data and downloading the information. Um, so we're in the early stages of that. And, and we're reaching out to, you know, not just ODF, but for service, all different uh, agency, resource agencies that have been measuring temperature. And I see a couple of raised hands. So uh, from Brenda and Cindy, uh, I'm not sure where they came in, which is first, so I'm not going to ignore that. But uh, Brenda, how about your question? Sure, thanks. Uh, Kara, thanks so much for a great presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, on that uh, last slide, uh, or second to the last slide that shows the map, uh, um, could maybe wonder if we could go back to that. It was kind of difficult to see the different uh, stream reaches. Uh, yeah, there. Um, under current conditions, it seems to me, if I'm seeing it correctly, quite a few of those stream reaches are already in the kind of more on the less suitable side, and they just get worse over time. Is that a correct interpretation? It is. Great, thank you. But it certainly could be improved. This is showing sort of the status quo, um, you know, high emission scenario. And how could it be improved again? Well, one, if, <laughs> I guess it could be improved if, if we, as a society, you know, reduce emissions and do sure. that, that side of things. But also the things that I had mentioned earlier about sort of these local driving influences on temperature um, would really improve that, that map if we could reduce these stream temperatures through shading, through you know, water exchange, sort, those sorts of pathways. And, and upland management and, and, and things like that. Yeah, thanks for that. One other quick comment, uh, question for you. Uh, DEQ uses um, shade curves in, to try to understand um, whether or not a, a, a system that has a TMDL might be improved over time. Do those shade curves at all relate to what you have produced here in terms of trying to mitigate some of these um, uh, issues in the basin? That's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to look into it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, thanks, Kara. Okay, and Cindy? Uh, Kara, thank you uh, as well from me for a really interesting presentation. And I want to zero in a little bit on uh, uh, sort of changes in uh, uh, things we can do with land management uh, to try to uh, mitigate for the warming temperatures. You mentioned a couple of times uh, shading both in the riparian and in the uh, uh, upland areas as having significant impacts on temperature. Um, do you have some specific ideas of the kinds of uh, management actions that would be most beneficial for uh, uh, mitigating against the increases in temperatures? That is a great question. Uh, so first, uh, the shading is really a, a riparian focus. I think the upland has a lot to do with water quantity, soil moistures, and things like that. Um, this is not my area of expertise, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to pretend like I, I know these things, but I will mention that the model that we are using to look at these things could be extremely beneficial for you, would be Velma, and what it does is it takes all of that data and all that information, particularly relevant to water quality and water, water quantity, uh, and, and runs these different land management scenarios, so you can kind of see the, the most equitable approach or the best approach that would uh, maintain stream flows and, and keep temperatures lower. Um, that's probably the best answer I could probably give you, given that that's not my focus. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay, and Jim Kelly? Yeah, uh, Kara, great presentation. Um, and I hate to even be uh, asking this question, but looking at the range of uh, uh, increase of uh, 
temperature um, towards the end of the century. Has anybody done modeling to take um, parts of Oregon like the Siskiyou? Um, and uh, if in fact um, we are in that circumstance where the, uh, the, the uh, temperature has changed that much and stream temperatures would uh, change uh, as per the models, what part of the world um, the Siskiyou or Oregon, um, uh, what part of the world today would have a similar climate, uh, similar stream temperatures? Where would we be? Has anybody done anything like that so we can visualize what we're up against potentially? Yeah, for this region, it's extremely similar to what California has been experiencing. And it's, it would look a lot like Central California. So, so we, if we're on the current trajectory, um, it, we would be in the same sort of situations that Central California has been dealing with for the last decade or more, I guess. Good. Particularly Thank for you. this region, yeah. Got it. And thanks, I don't see any other hands up, so I think uh, we'll go on to Gordy now. Thank you again, Kara, for it. it was Thank a great you. presentation, appreciate it. Okay, well, um, half of my presentation was just made by, uh, by Kara, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna move uh, somewhat quickly, but I wanna address, I think I can address some of the questions that were, um, uh, directed at Kara about what we can do. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Next, I'm trying to move it myself, but uh, next slide. You know, as Kara pointed out, you know, what we see climate change projections, they tend to be from these very large scale uh, areas, and we see a, a pattern of looks like a lot of change is happening. Um, next slide. You know, and that occurs at sort of a global scale down to a national scale. Next slide and down even into the region. And so we see these patterns, but what we will need to do is Kara illustrated with the use of the um, Northwest uh, projection is really get down to the local level. Okay, next slide. Because I think there's a tendency, you know, to, you know like we get either completely uh, flummoxed by what we can do. And when we look down to the next slide, when we look down to the local scale, we see that there's a lot more variability. Now I didn't go, I, I'm using Northwest, and these are August temperatures, uh, similar to the projections that um, that Kara used. And I want to you know, reiterate her point that these are probably the best temperature projections we have. And um, these are done by Dan Isaac and company out of out of the Bo uh, out of Boise. They do take in I should t into account when they make these projections. They do take into account flows, so it's just not a, a temperature projection. But one of the th things you see is there's a lot of variability. Now I'm only going out to 2040, not to 2080 like Kara did. But again, you know, uh, what you see is there's, there's going to be change. We see between, you know, between 1993, 2011 and 2040, an expansion of the uh, amount of warm water. And in this case, what I've done is broken it out by temperature. So that dark red is, is 20 degrees, which is when we really see native fish begin to a struggle with water temperatures, and then the orange is 18 to 20, and then uh, below 18 is in the um, in the yellow. And this is just a small segment of the area, but I think it represents, as you saw from Kara's stuff, uh, quite well. Next slide. And if we look at it closely, we can see that as we move forward, there's going to be a lot of variability out there on this landscape. It's not going to be a uniform response um, uh, to uh, Increasing water temperatures corresponding to increasing uh, increasing air temperatures leading to, to more to warmer water. There's a, there's a lot of inherent variability. Uh, next slide. But I want to I just threw this in just as an example. This is the this is I'm working on the Elliott State Forest, and the patterns that we're seeing in the Siskiyous are not necessarily representative of what we're going to see across the state. In in the more coastal areas. A uh, very little area is going to get to that 20 degree threshold. It's, it's shown in the red. So keep in mind that what we do, or what happens in the Siskiyous, is not necessarily going to be representative of what happens uh, elsewhere in the state. 
Next one. And this is the um, slide that um, uh, Kara showed from Steve Wanzell's work on the on the John Day. And I think the take home message here is, you know, the young forest are, are 10 meters and 30% effective cover. Um, and how that varies across that landscape as opposed to the mature forest, which is 30 meters and 50%. And so the, the, the nature of the riparian forest is going to exert a strong influence on uh, how that forest is going to affect water temperature. Uh, next slide. Um, and here, you know, we look at, at the at temperature and the key message, I think, from Steve's work, and there's been a, a two other studies, one on the John Day and one over in the Grand Ronde, that have suggested that riparian vegetation, first of all, is, is the biggest influence on water temperature that we see um, out there. But if, if we can restore riparian areas, we can potentially offset the, um, the effect of climate change. I think that's a really important message that the riparian areas can potentially mitigate the, the responses that, that we've seen uh, happen. So that, that, you know, there is hope, I, I, I guess, is the, is the bottom line. Next slide. Now, as we look across this landscape, we also will, will, will note that um, the influence of riparian vegetation, similar to, similarly to water temperature, is going to vary. And this is some work that we've done, uh, taking the Northwest projections and then trying to look at ways that uh, we can begin to address those challenges. And what you're seeing here, the areas in red, they're outlined on the map here, and are portions of, of areas on the stream network where riparian vegetation exerts the most influence on stream temperatures. Kara, Kara alluded to it briefly that there are other conditions that are other features of the landscape that influence water temperature. They include um, topographic shading, the topography, and the orientation of the stream. And what we've done is taken the Northwest projection and then identify where on the landscape uh, riparian vegetation would make a difference with regard to the water temperature. So again, it's not going to be uniform across the, um, the watershed. It can be highly variable. It needs to be places, if we're thinking more strategically, where we would look for riparian vegetation to really make a difference. Uh, where it could really make a difference in terms of um, influencing water temperature. Next. And you can see here, you know, that just to, just to um, um, show this down at a, at a smaller scale, and what you're looking at are the temperatures uh, in, the, in the system. This is Bear Creek. And then the portions of that network where uh, the riparian bed, either the restoring or enhancing the riparian riparian vegetation would make a difference in water temperature. And I know with ODF, it's the focus on the small and medium-sized streams. Um, and, you know, that, we, well, first of all, that's probably where the, the riparian veg is going to have the biggest influence. But it's really critical for us to think about the role of those, those particular streams, because what they're going to do is we cool them, they're going to provide uh, cold water refugia in these larger river systems, which are, where riparian zones may not be as effective. So addressing this problem is real is really key to helping with uh, the persistence of the native fish. Uh, next slide. But I think one key thing here is, is because of the application of the rules to fish bearing streams is we need to identify what is a fish bearing stream. Our work on the Elliott uh, we've, I, we, we've been using information from uh, research at the H.G. Andrews Forest uh, that suggests that fish bearing streams are really up to about 20%. Using eDNA, they're finding native cutthroat um, into areas up to 20%. And if you look on the Elliott, uh, that's about a 30% increase in terms of the fish bearing network. And again, this is going to be critical in terms of how the extent to which um, riparian applications will apply. Okay, next slide. Just to give you a, a, a note, the Northwest projections, along with those riparian identification of the key riparian areas are available for this entire area that's outlined on the map. 
Um, we did this as part of a pilot effort for the US Forest Service. Uh, so all these data are available um, to anybody who wants them um, to use um, for analysis or monitoring. In addition, we've got identified um, changes in flows, both summer and winter, and where they're likely to occur on the landscape, and then identified uh, where landslides are going to occur uh, in the future. And that's gonna be a real key because of, uh, Kara talked about the transition from snow to rain um, in many of these areas and increase in, in winter precipitation, and that's gonna likely increase uh, the, the occurrence of landslides. And those are also identified in this. So, okay, next slide. Um, so just to summarize, you know, real quickly, and again, just building off of Kara's stuff, uh, the size and the structure of, of the riparian zone is going to be really critical and, and probably our, our key way of addressing climate change uh, with regards to water temperature. Next one. And, you know, given um, limited resources um, and the, or the need to move forward, we're going to have to be strategic. And, you know, we're going to have to require some type of analysis to identify uh, where we're going to go to do these work or where we're going to apply regulations. Um, and so some type of analysis, I think, is, is called for here. And we also need to think about the use of variable width buffers. Do we need to have a one-size-fits-all approach to this problem, or can we form constrictions and bulges across the landscape and try to uh, meet, accommodate that so that we can minimize potential economic and social costs um, uh, involved with uh, with the meeting these challenges. So with that, I'll close. And you know, there was a lot of stuff to care covered that I, I have some uh, I could potentially address. But any questions? Yes, I see Joe Justice has a question. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Gory. Appreciate that. That was that was great. I, I do agree, Gory, with um, being strategic about what we're trying to do and potentially variable with with buff buffers, which is an interesting idea and it'd be interesting to try to implement that regulatorily. Um, uh, one question, you're talking about the west side and the impacts and stream temperature related to back, is several slides being in your presentation. Yeah. I just wonder if you could put a little more color on that in regard to, I, I think what I was trying to understand, what I was understanding you to say was that climate change potentially wouldn't have the same impact on a different type of forest type. Is that what you were trying to say? Well, not, I, I think in, it, it it, I don't know if it'd be forest type, but certainly across the region, the expression of climate change or the extent of the effect of climate change is going to vary. The Elliott, for example, because of its proximity to the coast, which most likely is the, is the reason, is not going to see nearly the temperature, extent of temperature increases as you would see in Southern Oregon, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the Siskiyou. So if you look, unfortunately, one of the things that happened is the person who does our graphics would boot it out of the office and doesn't have access to all <laughs> everything. So I just had to bootleg a bunch of things here. But if you look at that data set, there's a tremendous amount of variability. I mean, what Kara showed you and I showed you from the Northwest projection for uh, the Siskiyou region is if you took that and applied it across, you know, uh, Western Oregon or, or Oregon in general, you'd see a tremendous amount of variability. And so that's one of the challenges here is, is there, well, it's one of the challenges and I think one of the benefits is it's highly, the expression of climate change is not gonna be uniform, it's gonna be variable. Yeah. And you know, that's something we can both, you know, I think we, we should be using to our advantage as we think about how to move forward with, um, with meeting, um, uh, you know, the demand to, to address it. Okay, and Mike Rose, I think has a question. Yeah, I just needed uh, a little bit of clarification uh, as far as uh, building partnerships and and um, you know how we proceed and as we start planning uh, to build uh, things in for the future for um, for this. Uh, just out of curiosity, and I just want to use this for an example. Um, uh, Bear, the the map of that you had up of Bear Creek and right. how went through um, uh, Medford and Talent and Phoenix. Um, 
and and the high temperatures of those tributaries uh, as it went through. Uh, just out of curiosity, uh, as as the board of forestry, the or you know who who has jurisdiction to make changes on those. Um, if they go through a town or, you know, if, if it's different land ownership or, uh, you know, how, how do we take care of that if, as we're, as we're building or looking for things to improve? You're asking the wrong guy here. I don't, I don't understand the sort of the regulatory aspects of it. I assume it, it's going to take, a, you know, a, in a, um, coordination with uh, a suite of agencies, you know, regulatory boards, whatever. But I think what it shows is, is that, you know, they're, they're, where you're going to need that coordination and where you're going to have to strive to, 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 to achieve it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And uh, Brenda McComb. Thanks for a great presentation. That was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, and, and the variability that you're describing is, is really not that surprising, right? I mean, right. Uh, we're in a pretty complex uh, part of the world here. Um, but under current conditions, uh, from what I can take away, there are stream reaches now that are placing uh, temperature constraints on some of the salmonids in the southwest region. Is that is that a fair statement? I think that is. And those and those conditions are likely to get worse in the future, especially where the variability is expressed in terms of higher temperatures. Yes and that um, attention to those areas where the variability would result in higher temperatures could be mitigated by streamside vegetation management or riparian buffer strips? Uh, in some cases, yes. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of cases, probably yes. Because one, I mean, I think the thing that's important to recognize is if we're going to address the issue of increasing temperatures, the, the work in the, the literature is suggesting that riparian veg is the way you're going to, to, to do it. Um, Thanks. That, so um, then from a regulatory standpoint, um, you know, variable width buffers make complete sense, right? It, it's, the, it's the ideal trade-off between maintaining ecological function and minimizing economic impacts. Is that, is that fair? I think that's a fair statement. So from a regulatory standpoint, how do you see that playing out in terms of uh, some sort of a policy or, or rule uh, that would allow us to achieve that goal? And sorry well, to put you on the spot, but that's yeah, really you know, what we're facing. You know, I mean, it seems to me what it called for is some type of an analysis process. And, and, and then maybe, you know, where you'd have to agree, okay, here's the analysis that, that is required and then you might, you know, you have to, one of the things is I, where I struggle with this and where I'm talking with Norm Johnson and others about it, is one of the things we have to recognize that it's going to mean that everybody is going to have a different uh, response. Um, and some people, it may be, you know, take a, a more, a bigger change than, than others. How do we, compensate how do we provide some incentive for doing this uh is going to be the challenge in my mind um not that it can't be done it's just how do we implement it in a way that's it's fair across all land ownership because it's not you know people aren't going to be asked to respond uniformly good i, I agree thank you appreciate it but i think it it, it you know it, it could the, the information is there um the analysis is not going to be that expensive, um, and and it could be done. You know, we could start doing pilot efforts on that. I think right now, um, it, it's how do we how is it going to be implemented? I think is going to be the challenge. Thanks, Gordy. Tom, it looks like Cindy has her hand up. Tom, you're muted. 
I was pressing the thing to unmute myself, but yeah, I've been trying to call on Cindy. So, <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got sort of a, a, a two part question, I guess, uh, because as a board, we need to, if we're going to act, we're going to act in two parts. Um, the, the, I'll, I'll actually go to part two first, which is if we decide we need to make a change in, in our management, uh, because we want to try to offset the impacts of climate change on temperature, you indicated that riparian shading and riparian restoration uh, uh, has the potential to offset uh, uh, the climate impacts we're likely to see in the next 50 years in any case. Uh, could you uh, share with us a little bit more in terms of what riparian restoration or conditions would be necessary in order to affect that offset? Well, I, I, it, this is funny because I just had a discussion with Steve Wanzel this morning to make sure I understood their work. And he, as he said, you know, the key part of this is going to be increasing the effect of shade. Uh, from the riparian zone. And that's going to be a combination of the size of the riparian areas uh, as well as the composition. And, and like Kara, this is, you know, you, this is not my area of expertise, the physics of, of water and water warming. But I think that's where the focus has to be. It, 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 do we, are, they, are they of a sufficient size and a sufficient, a sufficient composition to actually provide the actual shade reduce it's it's really reducing the short wave radiation, uh, and you know that those details I'm, I'd I'd have to leave those to somebody else exactly what they would be, but that that, that would be the area you'd have to go to. Okay, the 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 I'm going to sort of push your your boundaries on this a little bit further because in your answer you said something that was sort of intriguing, and that is the phrase the physics of shading. Yeah. Um. And one of the questions that we've had in trying to reach our near-term decision, of which I'll get to that in a moment, is whether information we have regarding impacts of riparian shading on stream temperature in other regions of the state or the world, for that matter, are applicable or informative for our decision in the Siskiyou. And it sounds to me like by your choice of the word, the the, or phrase the, the physics of shading um, is that we really are not looking at a, a what biological difference in forest type so much as we are the physics of the way sun and light and heat create heat on streams. Well, and how how the vegetation influences that? Right, right. So the 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 intersection with the region. And the forest type is just how much of a riparian area uh, uh, is needed in the different forest types in order to provide adequate yeah. of shading to protect stream tail. I think that that's correct. Yeah. Interesting thing okay. was that I, I I made a note about with Jessica, you know, noting about the conditions of riparian areas and you know the absence of fire. We've changed them dramatically. And um, are the you know are the riparian zones we have today going to be the riparian zones we have tomorrow, or what are the riparian zones we'll need tomorrow to meet this challenge of of, of water temperature? And that, that that would be a key question I think that needs to be asked. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. And then the other question, you know, we we all have a tendency, and me included, to talk about. The impacts of climate change is contextual information for the future. Mm. Uh, obviously, we have already been impacted by changes yeah. in climate. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question, the near-term question that will be before us this summer is whether our current uh, rules uh, are adequate to protect stream temperature under the current conditions. And of course, current conditions now are different than they were at the time the rules were originally implemented because the climate already has changed. Yeah. Um, and so uh, uh, relevant to the question that we're actually gonna be facing in July 
uh, from the, the information that you and Jessica both presented, are you seeing um, uh, evidence that would indicate that we are stressing temperature and therefore fish under our current management? I don't know. I mean, partly because I haven't delved into it enough to really okay. understand that. But again, I think a, a clear part of this should be some type of assessment um, based on our, our, you know, on as I said, the physics of the um, uh, of shading, uh, where where current regulations stand. Um, I don't know, and I, and again, that that's not something that I, you know, I'm ready to answer now, and nor would I be the right person to do that. But I think certainly you could get you could get some information on that and some insights into it probably relatively quickly. You get somebody like Steve Wanzell or someone to help you with it. Thanks. Yep. Great. Yeah, I see Brenda's hand up, Ms. Phil. Just uh, thank you, uh, Tom, and thanks, Gordy. Um, just a quick follow-up to Joe's question and Cindy's question. Uh, Gordy, you provided some information on the Elliott, which is farther north, uh, as well as the Siskiyou. Um, and the question has come up in the past that, uh, well, the, the Siskiyou is completely different from areas farther north, so we need to consider it in a very different way. Would you say that that's correct, or would you say that the Siskiyou conditions represent a point on a continuum that goes from north to south where effects of climate change would increase as you go farther south. Obviously, that's affected by topography and vegetation yeah. and other things. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, I think the principles are going to be the same. It's just how it's going to play out in a given spot. Is going to be, um, and, you know, topography is going to have a big influence on it. Um, but there's still that, you know, climatic gradient going from, you know, south to north that, that's going to be uh, key. And, you know, certainly in, in southern Oregon, I would say the riparian areas probably are really critical for uh, water temperatures. Thanks, Gordy, for that clarification. Great. Uh, can we unmute the other presenters and move to the sort of more panel discussion? Uh, so we have a half hour left for uh, this discussion topic. And so you could ask questions for um, all the researchers uh, if you have additional questions. Brenda, is your hand still up or, or uh, you do have a new question? I see a step. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, Peter, I'd um, let's see. Um, I'd also invite um, uh, staff and you to um, enter into that kind of a discussion. Any reflections, I think, from the presentations or additional questions, I think, would be really helpful. Um, but. Yeah, this is kind of an open session here from from for the uh, for the board and for the department. I think uh, in terms of, of additional questions, comments, suggestions, where we go from this. Um, there's been, you know, a, a, I think we've heard um, about increased collaboration among the the agencies and possibly the um, the, the boards as well on some of these issues. The fact that analysis, additional analysis needs to be done, you know, my question is kind of where are we in framing that up and, and how we would go forward with that. Um, but I welcome, uh, you know, additional questions or just observations at this point from, from uh, the group. Uh, this is Peter and I'll uh, ask you. So we do have a water core team, which is, uh, the natural resource agencies coordinating and trying to prioritize uh, investments in water quality. So there is a coordinated effort. And I think sort of one of the questions came up was, um, how do you coordinate among different land uses with different uh, regulatory and statutory frameworks? And um, there are real differences. The, um, 
the forests do have a regulatory framework requiring riparian uh, buffers and um, uh, re, you know leaving residual buffers on fish bearing streams. <laughs> I, um, there are different uh, regulatory regime for agriculture and then urban um, the, um, it's mostly left to counties or local cities um, and they often will adopt uh, voluntary practices for riparian areas. I was wondering if the researchers could comment when they look at a particular area where the challenges with stream temperature are the greatest. Uh, well, this is Gordy Reeves. I think the um, that what the map that I showed or the example I presented of where riparian zones are going to have the strongest exert the strongest influence on water temperature is an example of that. You know that um, that that you know the influence of other factors can can um, be stronger than uh, riparian vegetation in certain places. But in others, riparian vegetation is the key in terms of controlling water temperature. And it seems to me that in terms of coordination and, and, try and looking to, for efficiency, both in terms of the amount of um, the cost of doing something and where you're going to get the biggest returns, you would want to be strategic in where you do your investments and where you require changes, uh, rather than making a blanket one size fits all. And that type of approach that I illustrated, I think, could address your your question or your your, your uh, issue. Yeah, this is just I agree. Taking uh, Gordy's well, the, the Norway stream temperature projections plus Gordy's net map information, I think, could help you pinpoint areas on the landscape where we're expecting the most increases in stream temperatures, yeah. and also again where that riparian vegetation might have more of an impact. I do want to add too that it's you know it's going to be more than just riparian. It's going to have a lot to do with upland management, which is influencing stream flows, right? So stream flows and lower volumes of water really do impact and influence stream temperatures. And I, I wanted to make one comment about, you know, you're talking about jurisdictions and, and who has the regulatory um, authority. Uh, when I've been going through and trying to kind of coalesce people into this uh, temperature monitoring approach, uh, they're already thinking about this in, at local scale. So for example, in the Rogue, there is a group called the Rogue Valley Council of Governments, and it's sort of a municipal uh, cities. They deal with a lot of TMDL stuff um, and uh, environmental education, and they're engaged and interested in uh, you know, temperature monitoring and thinking about these approaches. And I think that's the value of, of collaboration is getting the, the local folks on the ground engaged and, and getting them uh, to find support locally um, to start making these changes. But I just wanted to pitch those two things that it's you know, not just about riparian. In some places that is the key. In other places it's really about water quantity and stream flows influencing temperature. And particularly in this region, um, that is a big deal. And Brenda. Thank you, Tom. Um, so a question for the panel. Um, Tom, you mentioned um, that more analysis needs to be done, but I guess what I'm hearing is that we already have a pretty good idea of where on the landscape um, there are issues now in terms of stream temperature and where on the landscape uh, additional attention or at least attention to uh, riparian vegetation and to Kara's point, upland management uh, might have the biggest effect. Uh, and I'd like to hear from the panel. Is, is that a fair assessment? I think it is. I, th I think that's a very, a very good. I think we've got a strong base from which to move forward to address, you know, to address those issues. Um, and we just haven't, we haven't taken advantage of it. I guess uh, the, the reason I mentioned that is I, that's what I read, Gordy, on your slide. And when you said we need to take a strategic approach, um, Maybe it's that the analysis needs to be considered. Uh, I don't know that you, whether you were talking about new analysis or, or just identifying what's out there, but, um, and then we need to uh, figure out, uh, you know, whether we should look at uh, variable kinds of uh, riparian um, regulation as opposed to one size fits all. 
No, I, I think I think the the tools are there, the data sets are there. It's the application of those is is what we would be looking for. Yeah, and I, I want to just mention that there are tools that can help you run different scenarios on the landscape with the great data sets that we do have um, that that will help you sort of game that, including some of the stuff that right, that Gordy's been doing, the stream temperature work, uh, thinking about different ways to manage the land to um, identify areas where you would want variable management. I agree. I think it, it particularly with the stream temperature issue, we have some of the best data sets um, around in, in terms of, uh, compared to other resource areas like mm -hmm. you know, vegetation, wildlife, there's a lot more uncertainty there, uh, but these these are cutting edge, really um, excellent data sets that can be used for applications. Okay, and I see Cindy, your uh, hand is up. Yes, thank you. Um, we've been talking a, a lot about how important it is to increase and restore effective shading especially on small and medium uh, uh, streams. We have heard from some of our public comment that, that there are areas within the Siskiyou where we have too much shade. Do any of you uh, see any situation where that might be the case? I don't. I, 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 would say, I would say they might be referring to the density of vegetation in riparian areas that could be affected by fire exclusion. Um, and, and in some cases, those riparian areas might be at risk of high severity fire where they, have, they might not have been historically. Um, so, so that is an issue. But, but the shade part, I wouldn't say is an issue. Yeah. I, I would agree. <laughs> I see your hand up again. Uh, yeah, just to follow up on that, um, Jessica, you uh, alluded to the fire risk uh, by leaving um, certain types of riparian buffers. Um, could you um, maybe expand on that in terms of how we might approach uh, from a policy standpoint? Um, describing buffers that would be effective even uh, or minimize the risk uh, to the buffers from fire uh, on into the future. It's an interesting conundrum. It, it is. It certainly is. I, there, there has been some work done in Southwest Oregon with even experimenting with thinnings in certain types of riparian areas. I would think those might be most effective uh, along smaller streams where the riparian, uh, the, the area of influence of the riparian, uh, the stream is relatively narrow. Um, and they look more like uplands than um, riparian areas you would see along larger streams. And in that case, you might be able to uh, reuse fuels and, and decrease risk of high severity fire. It gets much more complicated when you get in, uh, into um, the, the riparian areas along larger streams that have very distinct vegetation. Uh, you know, a lot of the hardwoods like alder. Um, it, I don't know how you would effectively thin um, those riparian areas. So in that case, it would be more an issue of upland management and trying to um, decrease the risk of high severity fire moving into that riparian area. Great, thank you. Any other comments, reflections uh, from uh, either board member, staff, or closing comments from any of the panelists. Okay. Uh, Brenda. I just Somebody want to else? say thank you to the board, uh, to the panel members. Um, this has been really informative and it certainly helped me gain a better understanding of um, what information is available for that region. So thank you very much. I also appreciate the, this is really helpful information and well delivered for us in uh, difficult circumstances just because of the, as we try our way through Zooming uh, on all of this stuff.
So we'll bring this to a close and we'll take a 10-minute uh, break and then recon reconvene. Good morning, Chair Imason, State Forester Doherty, members of the board. For the record, my name is Bill Herber and I serve as a Deputy Director for Administration. With me six feet away is James Short, the Assistant Deputy Director for Administration. Today we are in front of you to present Agenda Item 3, uh, the overview of the agency's 21-23 biennial policy option packages. The purpose of this agenda item is to provide you an introduction to the agency's proposed changes to its next biennial budget and seek the board's input on these changes. So before we get into this agenda item, since we have a few new board members to this effort, I thought I would briefly highlight the overall process in front of us. For the next few months, the agency will be preparing its 21-23 biennial budget for submittal to the Department of Administrative Services, or DAS. James will be talking about in the next slide about the timeline, but generally over the course of the summer, we will be preparing what is called our agency request budget or our ARB. And this will through the process uh, turn into the governor's budget toward the end of the year, normally in December, and then ultimately culminate in the legislatively adult, uh, adopted budget or the LAB after the session. Uh, that LAB eventually comes into the legislatively approved budget as there's a uh, legislative actions or e-board requests as the biennium unfolds. So that's kind of the major products through this effort. So while there is a lot of technical work already occurring, one of the first steps in this process is defining any proposed changes to our current service level. That is a level that defines our base level of operations. So these additions, the agency or the board feels it needs in order to advance the mission of the agency are called policy packages or policy option packages. You'll hear them referred to as POPs. These packages can, can contain positions, funding, and or spending limitation. And these things are what we'll be discussing today. So in January, James presented and the board approved a set of guiding principles for our budget development process. These POPs you're about to hear were developed with that framework in mind. In addition, they were developed with the current budget instru instructions as, as outlined by DAS. These instructions were presented prior to our gl current global situation, and we are likely to uh, and, and are likely to change as we move through this process. But it's important to note that we developed these pop, uh, POPs prior uh, with this uh, current uh, instructions that doesn't have any current restrictions. So occasionally, occasionally DAS will direct agencies to limit requests for funding or positions, but that's not the case as of yet. And it's important to note, uh, in the light of the, even in light of the current situation, projections show that the economy should bounce back rather quickly in the next biennium, so constraining requests now might not be in the best interest for future positions. So you'll see POPs uh, kind of uh, move forward uh, absent uh, the current context of the uh, uh, the global situation. With that, I'll now hand it over to James, who will discuss the timelines, and then we'll move into the divisions to present their policy option packages. Good morning, Chair Imason, members of the board, State Forester Doherty. For the record, my name is James Short, the Assistant Deputy Director for the Administration Department. I'm here to review the key dates of the 2021-23 budget process. There are five dates that the Board of Forestry should be aware of, as illustrated in the slide above. Last week, on April 17th, the agency submitted the legislative concepts to DAS. And today, April 22nd, the agency will provide an overview of the policy option packages to the Board of Forestry. Uh, we, the, we'll be back on June 3rd for the Board of Forestry meeting, where the Board will provide final approval and input of all the agency policy option packages to be included in the agency request budget. Then at the July 22nd board meeting, the Board of Forestry will review and approve the agency's 2021-23 agency request budget. Then finally on September 1st, the agency submits the, the agency request budget to the Chief Financial Office of DAS. Are there any questions on the general process before we move to the individual divisions? 
No, but, uh, but and just following what Bill said, I'd assume that there will also be um, uh, from the governor and DAS um, uh, additional uh, direction that we'll receive prior to, uh, the, the department will, rec will receive prior to our next board meeting where, where we will need to adopt uh, the packages, right? That, that is correct. At this point, at the last executive leadership team meeting, um, the state economists are expecting a severe decline for this biennium, uh, but a rapid bounce back. But there's a lot of uncertainty around that, and in particular, is if there is another surge of, of, of the coronavirus in the fall. And so we expect, uh, at this time, we were instructed to move forward with, the, as Bill said, with the um, current instructions and, you know, the overall predict, prediction prior to um, uh, COVID-19 was a slightly down uh, year or slightly down projection for the 21-23 uh, biennium. And even in those where there's a slightly down per, um, projection, they do ask agencies to prepare policy option packages to give the, the governor an option to uh, prioritize investments in uh, new areas. And um, we're also required to develop a reduction option uh, to allow that shifting of resources. Yes, that's exactly right, Chair Imason. Uh, uh, we anticipate instructions changing a little bit, but um, uh, you know we're trying to uh, set ourselves up uh, in the best position forward as we move uh, through for the next biennium. With that, uh, Ron Graham will be the Deputy Fire Protection Chief. Will be presenting on behalf of Fire Protection, but I'm not sure he's with us right now. Is he? Okay, Ron, are you there? Yes, I am. Uh, good morning, Chair Imason, members of the board, State Forester Darty. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, very good. Uh, for the record, I'm Ron Graham and I serve as the Deputy Chief of the Fire Protection Division. Uh, today, what I'm going to do is walk you through the um, three policy option packages that the Fire Protection Division is proposing. Uh, the first, and hopefully these are on your screen and you're seeing them, uh, is our fire season severity resources. This is a standard policy option package that we ask for every biennium. Uh, this is what we call our severity resource package. And uh, this is funding that is not in our base budget. So it comes through the special purpose appropriation in the governor's budget. And as I mentioned, each biennium we ask for this appropriation. This allocates uh, $2 million per year of general fund dollars. <clears throat> Excuse me that is uh, for supplemental firefighting resources, and that is matched by up to $3 million per year from the Oregon Forest Land Protection Fund. One nuance uh, with this current uh, SPA policy option package as from previous biennium is that we are asking for additional funds as our large air tanker contract enters its final year. And if we proceed with uh, continuing with a large air tanker contract, uh, we'll have to move to a next generation aircraft, um, something much newer than the DC-7 that we currently contract with, an aircraft that would be uh, federally approved and be able to be used on federal grounds that we support and then reimburse. So that is the difference in this um, SPA pop from the past is addressing the need for that large air tanker and the additional costs that come with that. The second policy option package that the division is proposing is our fire season organizational sustainability and modernization. This really is based on the work from the past over the fire program reviews, Secretary of State's audit, um, the fire program and division um, agency initiative, and then most recently the work by the governor's fire council. Uh, this addresses the needed capacity across the division and programs to sustain the firefighting mission of the division. So this is all about uh, positions and capacity and training um, and supporting our workforce uh, for the future. The third and final policy option package uh, proposed by the division is a severity modernization and an additional special purpose appropriation. 
So this is completely separate and different from the first and standard severity uh, special purpose appropriation. This is uh, consistent with what we've asked for in the last couple of biennium as well, is the need to address that um, there is additional funding needed and additional flexibility for the division and the agency to increase our contracting, um, whether it's exclusive use or call when needed contracts for hand crews, for uh, individual overhead resources, for engines, heavy equipment, and additional aircraft. As we've seen over the last you know, several fire seasons, our severity program has been really stressed to meet the demands of the districts and uh, support their initial attack and extended attack efforts. This kind of brings us further um, than just you know, moving us to the next large generation air tanker. This gives us the flexibility to implement additional contracting when needed, when those periods of high fire danger are presented to us and we have to look at our call when needed contracts. Um, currently, the severity appropriation is the only uh, funding that we have to do that. So that would conclude the Fire Protection Division's three policy option packages. Thank you. Are there any questions for Ron? Okay, we'll move to Private Forest. Uh, Good morning, for the record, uh, Kyle Abraham, Private Forest Division Chief. Good morning, uh, Chair Emerson, Board Members, State Forester Doherty. This is a much different perspective than what I'm used to normally at a board meeting, so it'll take me a minute to get my bearings. Uh, just kidding. Um, but we have, in Private Forest, we have three uh, policy option packages. The first one, supporting sustainable family community forestry. This one proposes new capacity for the division across all ownerships and land uses, uh, foresters would provide technical assistance to landowners and communities. We would uh, continue to deliver and administer incentive and voluntary programs, such as the Oregon Plan for Salmon and Watersheds and federal cost share programs, such as NRCS. This package would enhance ODF's ability to respond to forest health threats that in particular could impact family forest landowners and communities and these foresters would look also work directly with landowners, local governments, and nonprofits. You may recall that this was included in the agency initiative last biennium for folks that were engaged in that process. Um, we have pulled it out of the agency initiative, and essentially this will be um, one of the principles for private forests moving forward. So we think of, when we talked about this in the agency initiative, we really emphasized the wooey forester idea. Um, and now I think a perspective might be that we consider these field foresters, again, providing landowner assistance and forest practice administration. Second one is the Forest Practices Act monitoring for water quality, FPA effectiveness and implementation. Um, as you know, Oregon provides a one-stop regulatory approach for forest practices. We implement the Clean Water Act, fill removal, fish passage, and a number of other statutory and regulatory objectives. The Forest Practices Act specifically highlights monitoring in key, or, key areas of water quality, streamside forest, pesticide use, and landslides and public safety. And as folks are probably aware, we have a specific need right now to continue our effectiveness and implementation program. So this uh, option would give us um, additional capacity in terms of an aquatic riparian specialist, the geotechnical specialist, and most importantly, capacity to fully implement the compliance audit program moving forward. Um, and then finally, the last one on our list is expanded capacity for the sudden oak death program. This was um, at the request of the Sudden Oak Death Task Force, uh, which is convened by two Oregon legislators, uh, state, and natural, state and federal natural resource agencies. The department plays a key role in the Sudden Oak, Sudden Oak Death Program and particularly on the eradication side. So we were asked to develop um, additional capacity for implementing approximately $5 million worth of treatment in the Sudden Oak Death pr Program 
and then also developing the infrastructure and the capacity internally with ODF that would be needed to implement that. So that concludes the three um, pops that we have in private forest. Any questions? Kyle, it's Tom, just one. Um, my recollection is on a sudden oak death program that there was a fair amount of legislative interest that, that uh, uh, on this one as well. Is that still the case? Yes, uh, thank you, Tom. That is still the case. Um, I think the task force is trying to consider all options at this point for increasing funding. One of those is continue to work with the legislature and then also the POP through the, through the agency. Thanks. Thank you, Kyle. We'll move to Save Forest, Liz. Thank you, good morning. <clears throat> Chair Imason, State Forester Doherty, members of the board. For the record, my name is Liz Dent and I serve as the Division Chief for State Forests. The, we have one proposed policy option package for State Forests and this is to support and fund our recreation, education and interpretation programs. And if you'll recall, um, this anchors back into your October uh, retreat in which you, uh, we were asked to put together um, a POP for supporting this important program. Um, we have attempted to, um, we've sought general fund for our recreation education interpretation programs in previous sessions. Uh, so we were uh, pretty well situated to pick this up and put together this POP. Um, the theme here really is about public money for public benefits. Everyone here understands that our program is largely funded through the sale of timber. So if we step back and think about the services we provide that might be best suited for public money, this clearly rises to the top. Um, just give you a flavor for the services that we provide. Uh, we have 22 campgrounds and the past couple years that's uh, hosted about 40,000 campers. We have uh, 143 miles of multi-use trails for non-motorized use, use such as mountain bikes, hiking, equestrian use, uh, 461 motorized trails and 30 day use areas. So really a lot of opportunity out in the forest. In addition to these formal um, services, the forest really just gets a lot of use just from public access. So dispersed camping, hiking, fishing, uh, swimming. Uh, we're really um, a good resource for folks, particularly up in the Northwest portion of our ownership. And then we have the Tillamook Forest Interpretive Center. Uh, this is located on Highway 6, and um, it uh, in the past few years has um, received about 53,000 visitors, um, provided over 4,000 uh, education or education programs for over 4,000 students and uh, just provides a significant amount of forest management interpretation for the general public that comes through there. You can really think about all of this collectively as sort of the public facing portion of not only the State Forest Division, but just um, of forest management in general. So that, those are the sorts of services that we're seeking a general fund for. Be happy to answer any questions. Liz, it's Tom again. Is this, so is this pop, uh, do you anticipate that it is similar in nature to the ones that we have proposed before on state forest, uh, you know, for state forest recreation or are there differences? Um, and if so, how would you describe those? It, it really is similar to what we've proposed in the, pa in the past. So that means the money would go to funding positions and really maintenance of our current program. Um, given more time, we could look at uh, adjusting it in a way that might be better suited to have support um, by the legislature. But at this point, uh, this, it's framed up very similarly to how we've had it in the past. I see Brenda's uh, hand is raised and Joe's. So Brenda, do you want to yeah, thanks. go uh, Thanks, Liz, for that. Um, so my understanding is that if the pop goes through, Additional funding will come in, uh, which will uh, help the State Forest Division be um, a bit more solvent than it has, or 
is facing yeah. now. Um, but if it doesn't go through and, um, and log prices uh, take some time to recover and housing starts take some time to recover, then uh, is it correct that this will place state forests in even um, uh, tighter financial constraints? Yes, yeah, certainly because of our dependence on the timber market, um, we obviously, um, our financial situation is tied to that, you know, the ups and downs there. We are looking really um, carefully and strategically around the impacts of COVID-19 on the timber market. At this point, uh, Brenda, our perspective, our analysis um, is that we have a little bit of breathing room because we do have a healthy forest development fund balance. Um, that allows us to make really uh, measured and strategic approaches to any kinds of containment, if you will, on expenditures. We are at a minimally staffed level at this point with the agency and recreation education interpretation is part of our core business of state forests. Um, so any further reductions in that program would be uh, would significantly impair our ability to meet our you know, the social portion of our mandate. Thanks, Liz. Uh, quick follow-up. Uh, you mentioned that you're at minimally staffed level now. I, I seem to recall from the current forest management plan, there are three implementation levels. So, so are you at the implementation level now that is the absolute minimum? We can, thank you, Brenda. We consider um, right now that we're at the middle level. Uh, so the current plan talks about uh, three levels. One is, min is the absolute bare minimum of legally and contractually required. Um, the middle um, level speaks to um, prioritizing expenditures that on high priority monitoring projects and focusing on revenue generating activities. And then the third and highest level of implementation is the full implementation of the forest management plan. Thanks, Liz. Has there been any discussion about going to the very lowest level uh, if things continue to stay not great for um, income? Uh, yes, exactly right. We, um, we've formed a strategic team in our state forest division and we're looking at, we're setting up a set of financial metrics for us to track over time. Some of those provide very short-term, near-term information, tracking the market, Others provide a longer term perspective. These are tools that we're always using. Um, and so that what a combination of those tools uh, helps us to look a little bit farther out and anticipate if we're going to have to take significant enough measures that would take us down to the very lowest level of implementation. So we are watching out for that. And right now we see that, um, we don't think that's going to occur um, in the near future. Great. Thank you, Liz. Yes, of course. Thank you. And Joe, followed yeah. by Cindy. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I know Ron had mentioned the uh, fire season severity resources and then landowners matching the value of that or the ask related to that pop, the $2 million ask, then being matched by landowners. Um, I, I didn't catch how, how large are these pops as far as value? That, that isn't, I didn't see that as part as the the information that we received here. Uh, so this is Liz. The uh, State Forest POP is uh, the ask right now for the biennial um, funding is 7.7 .7 million. And that is really a characterization of how much it takes to fund our recreation program as well as the Tillamook Forest Center. Um, and just so that folks are aware, part of that funding also includes funding for um, a handful of deputy sheriffs to help um, where we're paying um, all a, a portion or all of the um, salaries for those deputies to provide for the patrolling of our state forest land base and to do some enforcement around our formal recreation areas. And what were the private forest pops values, Kyle? Here comes Kyle. Uh, the first one, Joe, is roughly about $3 million. Mm -hmm. So the additional forester capacity of roughly $3 million. The forest practices effectiveness implementation is about two. 
million. And then the final one for SOD was, I believe it was $6.9 million with 5 million for treatment um, prioritized. Okay, thank you. Okay, Cindy. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Liz, you talked at the front end of your presentation about uh, this pot basically being a recast of what we've done in the past, uh, but that there's the possibility of retooling it to better address uh, legislative uh, interest and demand. What would be the differences between this and a retooled pot? Yeah, thank you, Cindy. Uh, you know, we've got some, we have a some new resources that have come on board over the past six months to a year. Uh, we have a new manager for uh, that's overseeing our Tillamook Forest Center and our recreation program. Um, and then we have a new executive director for the Tillamook Forest Heritage Trust, which is the nonprofit arm for the State Forest Division. And so given time, which I just want to be clear, I don't know that I have, um, some time spent with those two uh, and and sort of garnishing um, ideas that they may have, fresh perspectives that might um, create more appeal. So as it's situated now, as it's characterized now, this maintains what we provide right now. So the question, you know, it, it sort of begs a question, well, if we were to frame it to offer some new and different services, would it be more likely to be funded? Now, the, if you think about that for a minute and going back to Brenda's question, the challenge there is it doesn't really provide the overall financial relief um, that would be provided if the POP funded our, our current services. So that's, the, what, that's what has to be kind of balanced out. Yeah, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it seems to me, I, I, and I perfectly understand your questioning whether or not you have the time uh, available to do this, uh, but given the uh, response, legislative response we've had in past years, it seems like it would be worth it to invest some effort into trying to figure out how we might shape this pop to get a better response. Uh, Cindy, this is Peter, and uh, actually the legislature has never weighed in on this pop because it's never gotten past the, um, the agency request budget and it's never made it into the governor's recommended budget. So it's not been, so that, the challenge hasn't been with telling the story to the legislature. The challenge has been, has it been a high enough priority uh, for the governor's office uh, to provide alternate funding uh, to a program that is currently funded through uh, the timber sale program. Yeah, right. thank you, Peter. Thanks and, for and that correction. Yeah, that, thank you. I appreciate that as well, Peter. It, it, and what, what really ends up being an important component when we get downtown and talk about this stuff is the voices of the counties and the stakeholders. So I, I know in the past, when we've had some discussions about this, there has been at least some observation that whether we're talking about uh, raising interest at the legislative level or with the governor's office, um, part of the problem is that there is no obvious um, what correlation between the provision of the money and the provision of the services uh, as then there's I can understand from the governor's perspective that uh, these services already are provided and presumably will continue to be provided whether or not the pop is there and perhaps what we need to do is think in terms of framing it into the the uh, particularly with the the likelihood that uh, we'll see some reductions as a response to the COVID-19 limitations. Um, uh, it might be useful to frame this in terms of here's what we, services that will not be, we will not be able to provide in the absence of the POP. Um, 
so that you're, you're uh, and, and some of those services might be things we currently are providing uh, so that, that we actually end up presenting some benefit for the investment of money that would otherwise not accrue. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And I, I, you're exactly right. I think that is what we have been asked to do by stakeholders in the past. And I'll just say that, again, it goes back to the earlier conversation around resources and this being able to sort of help um, uh, relieve some of the financial um, burden, if you will, of running the state forest program on, on uh, timber related funding. So um, it, it's at being at minimally staffed levels, I'm hard pressed to say, this is what we're gonna stop doing. Um, and, and so I've, I've just not been in a position to be ready to do that. So that would take a lot, um, a lot more thought. Because we're, again, we're just sort of uh, in a holding pattern, if you will, on the services that we're providing. Our experience in the past has been shutting campgrounds or access only creates bigger problems for the division and for the public. Any further questions then? Cindy, your hand is still up, just uh, so. Got it down. I got it, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Liz. And some uh, great questions there, as well as uh, you know the specifics of this pop. Uh, this agenda item was an introduction at a high level, so we didn't present a lot of the uh, um, financial impacts of it or position numbers. A lot of that's coming as uh, James outlined in the timeline. Uh, prior to the next uh, board meeting and the approval process, we'll be getting the board a lot more detailed information on this. The budget staff are currently working on the financial impacts. Um, through the position numbers and the uh, the uh, funding of these pops, so more more information on this coming. But I think we can provide you with some rough numbers as we work through the rest of this presentation. So next up is partnership and planning, and I'll hand that over to State Forester Dory. Um, board members, this is Peter Doherty again. Um, uh, with uh, Chad uh, now a U.S. Forest Service employee, at least. Uh, for the next uh, couple years, uh, and um, his position is now on hold in response that I mentioned earlier to our unexpected revenue declines. Um, we've made some changes, and um, Jeff Burns is serving as um, on our executive team and is serving as the main program manager for our Federal's initiative unit under the planning and analysis unit um, and doing all things shared stewardship, good neighbor authority and federal forest restoration and has taken over uh, Chad's work in those areas. And John Tekarzak uh, has uh, stepped up as a program manager for the planning and analysis unit and it's taken over Chad's responsibilities around um, the board work, uh, our regular work on climate, and then the climate change work plan. And so there are two pops here, and uh, Danny Norlander, our um, climate force carbon specialist, will speak to the first one. Good morning, Chair Imison, uh, members of the board, State Forest Authority. For the record, I'm Danny Norlander, the Forest Carbon and Forest Health Policy Analyst in the Partnership and Planning Program. Uh, this morning, I'm just going to mention what a little bit about the POP that we put together in response to Governor Brown's executive order. So that was EO 20 04, uh, which came out before COVID 19 emerged as an issue in the state. So largely what it does is it addresses some of the parts that are in that EO and that's broken out into a few specific things for ODF and some general things for uh, a variety of 16 different agencies. 
So specifically to ODF, uh, we have a report that's due to the governor's office on May 15th. So we'll be working on that. And that report will incorporate some of the things that we are hoping to do and a lot of the, the board work plan that has already been uh, approved and will be ongoing into the future. So it also is, uh, includes stuff on uh, climate impacted communities. So we have some stuff in the pop about that. And then coordinating with the Global Warming Commission on setting uh, goals down the road. Uh, and that work won't be completed until June of uh, 2021. From the more general guidelines that are set out to the 16 different agencies, boards and commissions, uh, in that is utilizing all of the available statutes and regulations that the agencies have. And within that is the, the carbon offset program that ODF has had for about 18 years in statute. And this pop pr provides some added capacity to start working at, on that in coordination with DEQ down the road. Um, and also looks at uh, increasing our particularly our urban forest footprint so that we can work on some more mitigation strategies and afforestation, particularly in urban environments. Um, so that is a, a very brief and overview of, of the forest climate change uh, mitigation and adaptation, Bob. And Jeff Burns will uh, talk about the second one, implementing shared stewardship. And Cindy, I see you have your hand up. Is that a question um, on the presentation we just had? Why don't you go ahead and ask that? You're, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, building off of the presentations that we had earlier today, one of the real possible promising co interagency collaborations that was, was mentioned was working with ODF and W to identify areas where climate impacts are especially sensitive to forest land management. Um, is there any, you know, is that something that could potentially fit under that first climate change pop if we had the funding to staff up? Would that be something that those folks could do or would that be a separate uh, uh, initiative that we have to make? No, I would say that that's included in that pop. Um, some of the positions that are included in the that climate change portion of that is, or the agency portion of that is coordination with other agencies. And there is a position that's specific to working with both other state agencies and federal agencies to, to work on adaptation and mitigation projects. Um, just to touch on that about the ongoing work that we have already is we've been involved with the Climate Adaptation Framework, uh, which is a statewide project with 23 different state agencies. Um, ODFW is a part of that. We have kind of a small natural resources cluster within that. And so I've been working with them closely on that front. So we are working on building those relationships already. Um, it would be nice to be able to add capacity to that so we can have uh, long-term and meaningful relationships with our sister agencies. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeff Burns. I'm like Peter had mentioned, um, I'm the federal initiatives unit manager, but serving as the acting partnership and planning program director. Uh, good morning, Chair Imason and the Board of Forestry, and thank you, Peter, for your time. ODF has a long-standing and productive relationship with our Federal Forest Service partners. We have been working on projects at the local level across boundaries for years now. Shared stewardship is the concept of expanding that success in cooperation on a regional and national scale. The Shared Stewardship MOU was formalized in August of 2019 by the State of Oregon and our Forest Service partners. And as you well know, ODF has developed a federal forest restoration program that utilizes all of the tools uh, that we can bring to bear to facilitate a holistic approach 
to the cross boundary for stewardship. The Good Neighbor Authority is one of those tools that has shown great success and enabled us to expand our productivity and influence in this area. Currently across the state, we have four Federal Forest Restoration Coordinator positions, and I'm in the process of replacing the Federal Forest Restoration Program lead. The amount of GNA work uh, has exceeded existing ODF staff capacity authorized in the FFR program budget. With shared stewardship recommendations and the Governor's Council on Wildfire response, we anticipate a significant increase in restoration and fuels reduction projects across the landscape uh, that would require additional capacity in the 21-23 biennium. Uh, for example, a federal forest restoration coordinator position is needed on the west side where a lot of GNA restoration work has been generated but not yet acted upon, including timber sales and additional fuels reduction projects. We believe this warrants a full-time coordinator position that eventually, hopefully, becomes fully funded. Funded That is the goal of the program, to become fully federally funded. This will help enable us to expand our capacity to be, meet the needs of not only ODF and our Forest Service partners, but the multitude of diverse stakeholders in that region. Uh, I'll stop there and answer any questions that you may have. <clears throat> in terms of uh, rough dollar amounts for both of these two policy packages, the climate uh, package is roughly around uh, half a million dollars, and the shared stewardship is uh, right around three and a half million dollars, <throat> with the majority of that being in federal funds, although there's a, a certain amount of general fund as startup. Any questions for Jeff? I don't see any hands up at the moment, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. <clears throat> so we'll wrap this up with administration, and I think we can keep ourselves on time, even though there's nothing really following us, but we won't keep you here all day. So admin has the most pops, both due to the breadth of services we provide, as well as some of the mandated processes we need to adhere to. Um, I will be keeping these at a high level, uh, one due to timing, like I mentioned, but also uh, these are likely likely to evolve over the course of the next uh, couple of months. As you are aware, we have been working with a consultant MGO who is looking at many of our administrative processes, and we want to be mindful of their work and leverage their recommendations as we develop our next biennium's budget. So these admin pops, specifically some uh, some of them that I'll highlight uh, will be changing as we work with MGO. The first one is our agency deferred maintenance and capital improvement. This pop is a standard one since 2017 where Senate Bill 1067 dictated that the governor's recommended budget shall identify 2% of current replacement value of all state owned infrastructure uh, for deferred maintenance and capital improvement projects. So this pop is our agency's portion of the 2%. As I've, uh, this part, this is really part of the statewide effort. So in June, you'll be hearing from our facilities management program on specific efforts. Our agency is moving forward to address its own deferred maintenance needs, but this pop is part of that statewide 2%. Next is our uh, firefighter life safety. One of our uh, essential uh, functions in statewide continuity of operations plan is our ability as an agency to provide wireless communication services and infrastructure. But beyond being part of a greater statewide system, this service is instrumental in allowing us to respond to our wildfire fighting efforts. So this POP identifies strategic investments that are needed to address critical infrastructure deficiencies and enhance interoperability across our wireless communication network. This will be accomplished by rehabbing many of our site infrastructures and upgrading our radio and microwave systems. One benefit of these upgrades is the ability to provide automatic vehicle location services for our fire, firefighting resources. This would let us see where our trucks are actually depo deployed on any given time. 
This is critical need if we were to provide our firefighters the next level environment of safety. In uh, 2018, the federal government passed the Wildfire Management Technology Advancement Act, and it mandated, I believe, by 2021, that all their personnel and resources are tracked through real-time GPS devices. So this POP would allow us to implement the same type of system. Although we're not doing it because the feds mandated it or that they're doing it, uh, we're doing it because it's the right thing to do to put our uh, personnel in the most uh, safe position as possible. In addition, as this POP focuses on firefighter safety, there is an additional uh, agency safety officer included to assist us uh, with the work that is driven by the incre increased fire load that we are seeing. This position was previously in our agency initiative and, and it's moved out here, uh, much like Kyle mentioned earlier. This POP uh, roughly will be about uh, two to four million dollars have about four positions within it of uh, likely limited duration uh, a mixture of limited duration permanence next is our diversity equity inclusion environmental justice slash sustainability and government to government leadership we really got to come up with a better title on this one um, but this pop identifies two positions to address various agency needs in diversity, equity and inclusion, environmental justice and government to government. Uh, to better align our efforts with the governor's office and the values of the state forester, we are looking at additional capacity in these areas. This will allow us to fully integrate statewide strategies into our agency culture and promote our efforts uh, with underserved communities, both internally and externally. Our role as stewards of our resources go beyond special interests and these positions will allow us to integrate our efforts into the communities we might be missing. And uh, likely about one to one and a half million on that one, like I said, two positions. So uh, critical to, to move any of those efforts along. Next up is admin modernization. So this is a big one really driven by MGO efforts. Um, as the admin administrative branch continues to align administrative functions across the agency, it has become clear that many processes and information systems are operating within disparate silos, lack of standardization, outdated technology, and limited capability to adapt to improving, improving business practices. In addition, the agency's ability to provide contemporary services in a dynamic and fluid environment is hampered by our staffing constraints within administration. This POP was outlined well before MGO started assessing the, uh, the agency, but through their work to date, they've identified the very same limitations. So this POP addresses those issues with resources in several key areas, such as information technology, public affairs and information management and human resources. This POP is the most likely to be refined as we continue our work with MGO. Uh, likely will be in the, in the ballpark of uh, $5 million with uh, six positions outlined, I would uh, gather to say. Any questions so far? Because with that, I'm going to hand it over to James to discuss our last POP, the Facilities Capital Management Program Capacity. Okay, the facilities capital management program concept addresses the workload capacities needs within the facilities program. The program is requesting to add capacity to address the workload capacity limitations in both the statewide and Salem campus operational units, meet the statutory and governor's executive order performance and sustainability requirements, manage the department's buildings and structure asset portfolio data management system, provide facilities management and construction project management capacity within this program Salem campus and statewide operational units, and finally enhance the responsive adaptation and reoccurring maintenance and investments required to manage the department's extensive network of aging facilities in Salem and in the field. This POP is approximately $1.5 million of personal services and SNS with an additional five FTE. Any questions? All right, thank you, James. So that wraps up our high level overview of our POPs and is a, 
only opening a discussion with these. As I mentioned, this was an overview introduction and there's no de decision point uh, for the board here today. This is truly to uh, start having the conversations. Our budget staff are currently working on the position of financial components of these POPs. So in the near future, you will start seeing what the cost, of, the true cost of these packages will be. Um, and we will keep you apprised of any changes to our approach as the situation changes regarding the direction set upon the agency. With that, any further questions or can we move on with this topic? Kelly. Yeah, I just got a thought. Um, thinking back to our last pop that the uh, governor's office did not support, I remember at that time being told by their office that the um, reason that happened was that uh, our main stakeholders, timber industry and conservation community, could not um, agree about the priorities. So the governor's office threw up their hands and uh, it really didn't have to do um, with uh, the, you, you know, um, uh, how, uh, how well put together it wa was. It, it had to do with the fact that our stakeholders um, were in disagreement. And it seems to me um, that that is going to remain core, especially in the uh, financially constrained environment that we're going to be in. Also reflecting on the fact that um, we have this memorandum of understanding between uh, those previously warring parties at this point. Uh, I would think that we need to have a process since we now have um, the, those two parties um, more able to work with each other uh, before this goes to the governor's office so that we can feel that there's been some sort of mediation and, um, and that we've got strong support from both sides for what we're, we end up proposing. So anyhow, that was my thought on that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> thank you, I appreciate that. Um, we have um, started joint um, meetings with our ad hoc group, which is primarily landowners and uh, operator representatives, as well a uh, joint meeting with them and our conservation collab. And those are quarterly and we will be uh, presenting uh, POPs to them as they develop and getting uh, feedback on that. And uh, we're hoping that creates an additional venue for uh, understanding and collaboration around support for our POPs. Um, the other thing that has changed since the last time is um, the Governor's Council on Wildfire Response was a, a pretty broad coalition, uh, much broader than our traditional stakeholder group that came out strongly um, in favor of those recommendations. And while we uh, broken out components of the our agency strategic initiative from the last round. Um, they still reflect the recommendations of the wildfire council. So I th I'm hoping those two things together. Um, and I think the other challenge that I heard was that they, you know, it was an integrated pop, and they weren't sh sure how to scale it. And so having it somewhat in smaller pieces may help them think about scaling. And so that might be uh, a way of get, getting some of it through into the record, our governor's recommended budget. Because it does create a challenge when uh, it's not in the governor's recommended budget, we're not allowed to speak to it as a important uh, policy option package. Yeah, well said, Peter. There's always a strategy as an agency to move forward with these things, you know, uh, collectively or individually. And last time we went collectively, I don't think there's any uh, right or wrong answer. It just depends on the situation. But I think our approach will behoove us well this, this biennium. Great. I, so I, I, that concludes that discussion. Thanks, Jim, for your comment and suggestion as well. Um, uh, now we'd like to do what we've been doing these last at least couple of meetings, uh, 
uh, kind of a quick review of what we've done, uh, any follow-up uh, necessary. This has been a fairly short meeting. Um, we don't, I should say at the outset, we don't know, obviously, um, what the format will be for our next meeting um, uh, and whether we'll be looking more like this or, or um, whether we'll be something closer to our traditional format. I do want to express appreciation to um, the folks who helped pull this together. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hillary was obviously a big part of that. And so it's, it's relevant that today is the day that is um, nationally recognizing administrative professionals because she has been really professional in her administrative responsibilities here. And Jason um, also played an important role in, in making all of this work. So um, appreciate that. I think one of the things we don't get the benefit of in this kind of a meeting, uh, at least we couldn't uh, today, is, is uh, public input. I do want to remind people, uh, we'd love to have your comments on the issues that we talked about today. And again, ask for th that in writing by May 6th. By May 6th. Uh, but hopefully, However, we meet next time, we can also have a, a stronger, um, you know, uh, stakeholder public uh, involvement in, in the meeting in real time. Um, so we had the two discussions today. One of one of the ones we just had, and the other one uh, uh, in which we talked. We had, I think, a really good panel. Um, but I invite um, board members um, for any commentary that we want to provide on follow up on either of these things um, uh, and um, before we adjourn today. So just open it up to, or Peter also for you um, representing uh, staff, uh, anything out of this that uh, for your particular attention. So uh, thank, thank you, you, Tom. I did want to, um, uh, note we all of our uh, ODF staff is staying online and division chiefs that are in the room are staying uh, that was one of the requests from the last closing comments in case a, a follow-up topic needs clarification so they're all here and available and then secondly um, well we things may change uh, my expectation is that the June meeting will be an online meeting um and i will hopefully be pleasantly surprised that it isn't uh but we're planning for that and hillary is working on um the option of uh facilitated public comment or public comment during this type of uh session and as board members think about this meeting we abbreviated on purpose because this was our kind of trial meeting for this uh, the June agenda is quite full, and we would be talking about an all-day meeting. So uh, if you have any thoughts about um, should we be trying to slim it down, or uh, will this work for an all-day meeting? So if you could comment on that as you uh, think about the today's and the topics we had today, that would be great. great. Okay. And I see Jim's hand is up. Is that? Yeah. Um, first, I, I would want to um, compliment uh, Peter and, and the agency and the staff. Just hearing what Peter uh, described earlier about um, what all they've done to adapt to this crisis, I'm, I'm real impressed. Uh, it sounds like they're making a lot of smart decisions. I did um, have one thought uh, regarding, uh, since we were hearing about the importance of shades and riparian areas, and um, Thinking about this issue of fire um, and fire prone uh, forests uh, uh, that can follow, um, I think Joe's talked about this before, follow a riparian area. I'm wondering, um, you know, I know we have uh, a, a process for uh, prioritization of uh, how we fight fires and what we fight, um, you know, structures and other priorities. Um, and I wonder if there's uh, a way that that sh that we should be looking at uh, as as uh, at these riparian areas um, and and um, how high um, we prioritize um, stopping fires in those 
areas, given the fact that we're all getting this information about how uh, key uh, those riparian areas will be today and in, into the future. I don't think it's the board's uh, responsibility to be micromanaging um, uh, exactly how we fight fire, but um, we just like want to bring up that issue and, um, and, and maybe get a response at some point uh, as to whether um, any changes can, can or should be made and what the trade-offs would be. That's it. Thanks. Thanks. Ron, do you have anything to add quickly? I know they do prioritize uh, special sites uh, special wildlife areas and special sites uh, when we think about the priority of a fire. But what can you add to that, Ron? You're right on, Peter. Any critical habitats, uh, stuff that um, T and E species habitat, and again, just values at risk. You know, resource values at risk as riparian areas would clearly be classified by some as a highly valued resource area at risk. So um, it certainly is factored in, um, in our current priorities. And perhaps, you know, given what comes out of this would be something that we would see some additional consideration for. Okay. Great. Other questions, comments? Great. Um, Oh, uh, Brenda. Just to follow up on that, thank you, Tom and Ron and Jim for that. Um, you know, responding to a fire to protect those high resource values is, is, is a great idea. And I'm glad to hear that that's being done already. Uh, but also thinking um, proactively about how to treat uh, upland areas and, um, and areas adjacent to riparian areas to uh, maybe not have quite so intense a fire when a fire does occur. So uh, I'm not sure how compatible fuels reduction might be. Uh, you know, I guess I'd want to learn more from, from um, our speakers today, uh, but maybe in some places strategically fuel reduction with some new prescribed burning um, may help uh, minimize some of the risk on into the future. Okay. Jim, are, I see, I don't know if your hand up, is that additional? No, I just forgot to uh, take it back. No problem. <laughs> okay, I don't see anything from anybody further. So that being the case, um, thanks everybody for your participation. Um, uh, stay safe and this meeting is adjourned.